Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight's story is Tom Caribou by Louis-Honoré Fréchette. This story comes from Fréchette's Christmas in French Canada, published in 1899. With this story, we commence November's Nightmares Before Christmas, honoring the ancient European tradition of gathering around the fire and telling strange and spooky stories during the holiday season. There are thousands of weird and dark tales that take place at the holidays, and November is the perfect month to bridge the ghosts of Halloween with the warmth of Christmas. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Quick crack, girls and boys. Parlons, parlez, parlo. The whole thing, if you want to know. Pass the spittoon to Fiddle Joe. Sack to be, sack to tabac. All who are deaf will please draw back. It is hardly necessary to mention that the narrator who thus commenced his speech was Fiddle Joe himself, my friend Fiddle Joe, presiding over a veillé de conte, a storytelling party, on Christmas Eve at the blacksmith's, old John Bilodeau. Poor old Bilodeau, it is over fifty years now since I heard the sound of his anvil, and I fancy I can see him yet, sitting at the light, with his elbows on his knees, and the shank of his short pipe tightly held between his three remaining teeth. Fiddle Joe was a queer kind of fellow, very interesting and very popular, who had spent his youth in the shanties and was very fond of relating his traveling adventures in the Pays d'en Haute, the timberlands of the Ottawa, the Gatineau, and the St. Maurice. That day he happened to have a fit of inspiration. He had been compere in the morning, which meant he had stood as godfather to a newborn child, and, as the accessories of the ceremony had brought a slight breeze into the sails of his natural eloquence, his stories went on marvellously. All camp and forest incidents, of course, fights, casualties, fishings extraordinary, miraculous hunting exploits, visions, sorcery, feats of all kind, he had a collection to suit every taste. Do tell us a Christmas story, Joe, if you know one, to fill up time until we leave for church, cried a girl by the name of Femi Boisvert. And Fiddle Joe, who prided himself on knowing what was due to the fair sex, had responded by the characteristic formula as above. Then, after having moistened his throat with a finger deep of Jamaica and lighted his pipe at the candle with one of those long cedar splinters which were used by our country folk before and even after the invention of phosphorus matches, he opened his narrative in the following terms. This is to tell you, my friends, that on that year we had gone rafting above Bytown at the elbow of a small river called La Galeuse, a funny name, but which is of no importance to what I am going to relate. We were fifteen in our camp, beginning with the boss and ending with the chore boy. Nearly all were good men, not quarrelsome, not given to cuss words. Of course, I don't speak of a little innocent swearing here and there to keep things going, and not drunkards, with the exception of one, I must acknowledge, a tough one indeed. As for this fellow, boys, he was not exactly what may be called a drunkard. When he happened to come face to face with a demijohn, or when his lips met those of a flask or bottle, he was no longer a man. He was a regular funnel. He came somewhere back of three rivers. His real name was Thomas Baribo, but as our foreman, who was Irish, always had some difficulty over this French name, we had nicknamed him Tom Caribou. Thomas Baribo, Tom Caribou, it sounded pretty much the same as you see. At all events, it was the fellow's nom de guerre, and the boss had caught it as easily as though it had been a name freshly imported from Cork. Anyhow, to speak in polite terms, Tom Caribou, or Thomas Baribou, as you wish, had a galvanized iron throat of the first quality, and he was, moreover, a patented ruffian, but something out of the common to give the devil his due. When I think of all I have heard him say against God, the Blessed Virgin, the good angels, the saints of heaven, and all the Holy Trinity taken together, I still feel a shiver down my back. 
Ah, the worthless swagger. What a scamp he was. He swore, he lied, he cursed his father and mother five or six times a day, he never said a word of prayer. In short, I don't hesitate to say that his miserable carcass, with his soul into the bargain, was not worth, with due respect to the company, the wag of a dog's tail. That's my opinion. There were not a few in our crowd who swore to having seen him on four paws at night in the fields, roving about in the shape of some devilish loup-garou. As for me, my friends, I saw the brute on all fours several times, but take my word, he was neither playing the loup-garou nor anything so respectable. I assure you, he was too beastly drunk for that. Anyhow, I must tell you that for some time I was one of those who thought if the rascal practiced any sorcery at all, he had a preference for the chasse galerie. For, one night, Tituan Perchard, one of our road cutters, had spied him coming down a big tree when the pagan had told him, Tuan, curse my soul. If you ever mention a word of this to anybody, I'll rip you cold, that's all. Of course, Tituan had not failed to tell everybody in the shanty, but in the greatest confidence. If you don't know what the chasse galerie is, my friend, I am the man to post you fine on the matter, for the chasse galerie I can boast of having seen with my own eyes. Yes, I, Fiddle Joe, one Sunday afternoon, twixt mass and vespers, in full daylight, I saw the infernal machine pass in the air, right in front of the church of St. John de Chalion, on my soul and conscience, as clear as I see you now. It was something like a canoe, which traveled rapidly as an arrow, at about five hundred feet above the earth, manned by a dozen reprobates in red flannel shirts paddling like damnation, with Satan standing in the stern, steering straight forward in the direction of three rivers. We could even hear them sing in chorus with all sorts of devilish voices, V'la bon vent, v'la joli vent. Footnote. The origin of this chasse legend can be traced to the Middle Ages. In France and Germany, they had what was called the Black Huntsman. It was a fantastic coursing which rode in the air with wild clamor and desperate speed through the darkness of the night. In French Canada, by a curious phenomena of mirage observed in some circumstances similar to that related by Fiddle Joe, a mounted canoe was seen flying through the air, and the same was naturally substituted for the black huntsman, who went also, in some province of France, by the name of Chasse-Galerie. It was supposed that the lumbermen, who, by the way, did not enjoy a very enviable reputation, managed, through some devilish process, to travel in this way, to save fatigue and shorten the distance. End footnote. But I may say there are many who don't require such a display to practice chasse-galerie. The regular scalawags like Tom Caribou have only to climb up a tree and launch themselves on a branch or a stick or anything else, and the devil drives them on. Thus they travel thousands of miles in a single night to concoct God knows what kind of jugglery in some infernal recess where honest people wouldn't set foot for a fortune. At all events, if Tom Caribou did not practice chasse when he used to steal out alone at night, peeping about to see if anybody watched him, it was certainly not to go to confession, for, to the astonishment of our gang, although there was not a drop of liquor in the whole shanty, the blackguard smelt every morning like an old whiskey cask. Where did he get the stuff? It was in the latter part of December, and Christmas was drawing near, when another gang working for the same firm, about fifteen miles higher up on the Galeuse, sent word that if we wanted to attend midnight mass, we had only to join them, for a missionary on his way down from the Nipissing would be there to celebrate it. By Jove, we said, it is seldom enough that we see an infant Jesus in the shanties. Let us go. We are not angels in the lumber camps, you know that, boys. Even when we don't plague all the saints in the calendar and scandalize the bon Dieu from morning until night, like Tom Caribou, one can't reasonably pass six months in the woods and six months on the rafts every year without getting a little off on his duties. But there must be a limit to rascality. 
although one may not wear out his knees in the church or play mystically every night with the beetle he likes to remember at times do you see that a good canadian boy has something else than the soul of a dog in the mould of his waistcoat so to speak consequently the trip was soon decided upon and everything carefully stowed for the occasion it was brilliant moonlight the snow was fine for a tramp. We could start after supper, be there in time for mass, and back again for breakfast in the morning, in case we couldn't spend the night over there. "'You shall go by yourselves, you confounded fools,' cried Tom Caribou, with a string of blasphemies, almost splitting his knuckles with a blow of his fist on the shanty table. As you may well imagine, none of us thought of kneeling down to coax the ruffian— the absence of such a parishioner could not spoil the ceremony, and there was no need of his sweet breathing voice to intone the sacred hymns. "'Well, if you don't wish to go,' said the foreman, "'do as you please, my dear fellow. You stay here to watch the fire, and, since you don't care about seeing God, I hope you won't see the devil while we're away.' Well then, boys, off we go, with belts tight around the waists, snowshoes well fastened at the toes of our moccasins, each with his little bag of eatables on his shoulder, and a twist of tobacco right behind his teeth. As we had only to follow the frozen bed of the river, the road was a trifle, of course, and we marched on, singing La Boulangerie on the fine, level, white snow, under a sky as transparent as crystal, without a crevice or jolting to hamper our progress. All I can say, my friends, is that merry parties of that kind are far between in shanty life. Upon my word, I fancied we could hear the old church bell pealing, Come on, come on, as in the good old times, more than once, bless my soul. I couldn't help turning around and looking back to see if we were not followed by some of the fine little Canadian trotters of home, with manes floating in the wind and a row of merry bells ringing at their martingales. That's what sharpens the wit of a country boy, I tell you, and you ought to have seen Fiddle Joe paddling his canoe that night. I suppose it's useless to tell you that our midnight mass was not as brilliant as an archbishop's ceremony. The vestments of the priest were not exactly what may be called imposing. There was no danger of being blinded by the glare of the altar decoration. The singer's windpipes were not oiled like a nightingale's throat, and the alkalites would doubtless have showed more natural gait with a shoulder under a cant hook than a censer at arm's length. You may add besides that there wasn't even the shadow of an infant Jesus, which, as you all know, is no small drawback to a Christmas performance. To tell the truth, the good old man Job himself couldn't have been more poorly fitted to say his daily mass. But no matter. There are lots of church services with music and gilded ornaments which are not worth the one we had that night, my friends. Take Fiddle Joe's word for it. It reminded us of old times, do you see? Of the parish, of the old home, of the old mother, and all that. Good gracious me, you all know that Fiddle Joe is no squinny or crying baby but I had never done passing my quid from one cheek to the other to control my emotion. But that's enough about this part. Let's see what had happened to Tom Caribou during our absence. I need not tell you that, after the mass was over, we returned to our camp by the same way, so that it was full daylight when we reached the shanty. At first, we were greatly surprised not to see a single thread of smoke rising from the chimney, but we were still more astonished when we found the door wide open, the stove without an ember, and not a trace of Tom Caribou. As true as I live, our first thought was that the devil had carried him away, a worthless chap like him, do you see? But, after all, that was no reason for not looking for him. Hard enough it was to look for him, for not a bit of snow had fallen for several days, and the consequence was that there were thousands of footprints around the shanty, and even in the surrounding woods, all so well crossed and mixed up together that it was impossible to make out anything of them. Fortunately, the boss had a very smart dog, Polisson, as we used to call him for a pet name. Search, Polisson, said we. And off goes Polisson, searching out right and left, his nose in the snow, wagging his tail, while the rest of us followed on with a double-barreled gun loaded with bullets, which I carried myself. A good gun in a shanty is like the petticoat of a woman in a family. Remember that, my friends. 
We had not been two minutes peeping through the branches when our dog suddenly stood still in his tracks, trembling like a leaf. Upon my word, if he had not been ashamed, I think this scamp would have made a right about for the house. As for me, I threw up my gun and stepped forward. You'll never imagine, my friends, what I saw right in front of me on the slope of a ravine where the wood was thicker and the snow heavier than elsewhere. It wasn't funny at all, I tell you. Or, rather, it would have been very funny if it hadn't been so fearful. Just fancy that our Tom Caribou was roosted in the fork of a big wild cherry tree, pale as a winding sheet, his eyes starting out of their sockets at the muzzle of a she-bear who clung to the trunk about two feet below him. Thunder! Fiddle Joe is not a man to skedaddle when called upon to face a squall, y'all know that. Well, this terrible sight made my blood whirl up from my toes to the nape of my neck. This is not the time to miss your aim, my poor fiddle Joe, said I to myself. Point blank, or God save your soul. Shifting was no use. Bang, bang. I aimed and shot both barrels at once, my two bullets striking the beast right between the shoulders. She gave a growl, stretched her paws, swung for a moment, and then fell headlong with her back broken. It was high time. My gun was still smoking when I saw another mass tumbling down from the tree. It was Tom Caribou, who spread himself fainting and sprawling right across the dying she-bear. He was terribly torn by her claws, which had struck him more than once, and his hair, well, now, try and guess, my friends, his hair had all turned white. Yes, white as snow. Fear had turned his hair white in a single night, true as I intend to take un petit coup by and by, with the grace of God and the permission of Uncle Bellidou, who shan't lose anything by it. Yes, honestly, the rascal had suddenly grown so old that some of us would not believe it was the same man. We hurriedly made a kind of hand barrow with branches, and we laid the poor fellow on it, cautiously handling that portion of his body which had been damaged by the bear's claws, and so carried him back to the shanty half dead and frozen nearly as hard as a piece of bologna sausage. After which, it was the bear we had to drag to the camp. But here's the fun of it. You may call me a liar if you wish— it wasn't credible, but the infernal beast seemed to have inherited poor Tom's most characteristic quality, and was smelling a rum like a seasoned cask, so much so that Tetouin Pilchat said it gave him a mind to lick the animal. But it was no miracle. You know, my friends, and if you don't, Fiddle Joe will tell you, that the bears don't spend their winters working hard as we do, poor lumbermen building rafts for the spring. So far are they from working that they haven't even the energy to eat. At the first frosts of autumn, they dig a hole between the roots of a tree and lie there for the winter, buried alive in the snow, which the animal's breath melts from inside, so as to form a kind of oven where they spend the whole season half asleep like marmots and licking their paws for a living. Our own, that is, Tom Caribou's bear, had chosen the roots of that particular cherry tree to shelter himself, while Tom had chosen a forked branch in the same, and you'll know what for in a moment. Only, as you remember that the ground was on a slope, Tom Caribou, which was quite natural, gained his branch from the upper side of the declivity, and the she-bear, which was natural also, had dug her hole from the lower side, where the roots were not so deeply buried in the sod. This accounts for these two savages having lived neighbors and almost partners without having ever met, each of them being under the impression that he had the exclusive possession of the premises for himself. You will probably ask what business Tom Caribou had in the fork of that tree. Well, in that fork there was a hole, and in that hole our drunkard had hidden a jar of high wines which he had smuggled into the camp. We never exactly knew how. I suppose he'd made us tow it under water behind one of our canoes at the end of a string. At all events, he had it, and almost every night he would sneak out and climb the tree to fill his flask. It was from this nest of his that Tétouin Pelchat had seen him coming down that time we spoke of the chasquerie, and that was why, every morning, one could have set the scoundrel on fire merely by passing a live coal under his nose— well then, after we had left for midnight mass, Tom Caribou had gone to fill his flask out of the hidden demijohn. 
On a merry day like Christmas, of course, the flask was soon emptied, although there was only one drunkard to treat, and Tom returned to his cupboard to renew his stock. Unfortunately, if the flask was empty, it was not the case with its master. On the contrary, its master was too full. The demijohn, carelessly handled and uncorked, overflowed on the other side of the cherry tree, right on the muzzle of the she-bear. At first the animal had naturally licked her chops, sniffing, and then, finding that this kind of rain had a peculiar taste and smell, she had opened her eyes. Her eyes opened, the whiskey had flowed into them. High wines, friends, it's no use asking if the beast awoke for good. On hearing her howls, Tom Caribou began to descend the tree, but not a bit. Stop, boy! The bear, having also heard a noise, had walked around the tree, and before the poor devil was halfway down, she had clapped a destroying paw on the most prominent part of the descending intruder. But the monster was too torpid to do more, and, while our heathen was climbing back up the tree, bleeding and terrified, she remained clinging to the bark without being able to follow further up. That's what had happened. So you see, if the bear smelt of whiskey, it was no miracle. Poor Tom Caribou. Between ourselves, it took three long weeks to repair his damages. Never could we convince the repentant drunkard that it was not Satan who had appeared to him and who had thus lacerated his feelings. You ought to have seen him begging even the dog's pardon for all his oaths and all his nightly sprees. He couldn't sit down, of course, and so he had to kneel, and that was his punishment for having refused to do so on Christmas Eve. And lifting his glass to his lips, Fiddle Joe added, Quick, crack! Sack it a bee, sack it a back. Here's to your luck, old Jack. This is a great story. It's part mythology and personal memoir and local legend and social experience and natural history. It's a bit saucy, it's a bit humorous. It's also funny because last November, Frechette told us that the punishment for missing Midnight Mass is to turn into a werewolf, while in this story, the punishment is to be bitten on the backside by a bear. By the way, the bit in this story about the chasquerie is a little foreshadowing. We will revisit the topic later in the month in greater detail. Fiddle Joe, or Jos Violon, Violon? is a fictional character created by Frechette, who often wrote weird and strange or supernatural tales, and he put the story in the mouth of a fictional character. Rather than using his own authority as the author to make claims about the veracity of the stories, he simply describes a story that someone else is telling, which heightens the suspension of disbelief. Regardless, this story feels so true, doesn't it? Like, of course, an old lumberjack who traveled around rural Canada had all these adventures and he would accumulate all these stories. And if he was good at telling stories and if he could play the fiddle, then of course he would be a welcome guest around the winter fire in a small town in the 19th century. And the story itself isn't actually that fantastic. It feels very plausible. Frechette was a great admirer of Mark Twain. The two men became friends, and I think we can feel that influence on this story more than in the others we've had on the channel. It's very natural delivery, the elements of humor and nostalgia and adventure. It feels like a true story written by someone who lived that life and knew those people. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is probably predictable and inevitable, and feel free to skip it, but of course it's election night in the U.S. And although I am no longer a citizen, and I am not eligible to vote, and I am insulated from the full effects of the outcome, and although the time zones are all wrong and we won't know the final results for some time, and then the final, final results for some time after that, I am still a bit worked up and anxious about it. Also, and this is the kind of a separate confession, but also kind of related, we've entered the time of year when it gets dark really early, which makes the nights very long, which makes it hard for me to do things or start things in the evenings. I mean, in the summer, it might be six or seven in the evening, and I think, oh, I can work on that project for a few hours. 
but in the winter, I think, oh, it's too late to work on anything now. <laughs> so anyway, I'm facing the prospect of a long, kind of bored, kind of anxious, distracting, uncomfortable evening. <sighs> Alternative proposal. A person could get drunk and mess around with early Christmas crafts and ignore everything else and be surprised when she wakes up at 3 a.m. and feverishly checks the news. And I think that's actually what I'll do. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, happy holidays to all, and to all a good night. If you've made it this far, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. This is going to be a long, fun, weird month as we dig around old Victorian tales of oddities at the holidays, and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in a few days.